Good morning. It's great to be here this morning at Midway. Thank you, Larry. That looks great. Uh, so great to be here this morning with you at Midway. Um, it's just been a wonderful summer for me. This is my last day, I think. And so um, it, it is, it's just been wonderful being with Mark, Connor, and the elders here. It's just been wonderful and being, most of all, with you. And so this will be my last lesson for the summer before I go back to Freed. And uh, I'm so excited uh, to go back, but I'm also sad that I will be going back and leaving y'all. And so uh, thank y'all so much for the great summer. If you're new here, uh, welcome. We're thankful that you're here, and uh, we hope that you enjoy your time with us. I don't remember how old I was, but we were at the beach and uh, with my family, and we went uh, a Sunday morning. We usually, we usually went, uh, and went to services on Sunday morning and uh, tried to make the drive back right after services. And uh, so we were, at, uh, we were at a new congregation uh, down close to the beach. don't remember if it was Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, or what. But we went, to, uh, we went to a church there, and we got finished. And we were walking out, and uh, my dad and my mom and my brother were with me, and we were going, heading to the vehicle. I don't know if you know what my dad looks like, uh, but still the story makes sense uh, once I get done with it. But we're walking out, and a lady... screaming, wait, wait, please don't go. And so she runs up to my dad, and my dad's got this black did this, but she runs up to him, and my dad turns around, and she says, you're Taylor Hicks, right? <laughs> and so... And dad, my dad could have played it off because she still thought that he was after he said, no, I'm not. I'm not Taylor Hicks. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really not him. And I wanted to tell you all that story because I thought that was a really good example of making a really bad judgment. I, me personally, I look at my dad, I think, that man looks nothing like Taylor Hicks. But uh, I don't think he looks like him at all. And so we have different judgments. I want to ask you this question, uh, which line is longer, the bottom line or the top line? Many of you probably know this trick already, and uh, you're probably one step ahead of me. And so this is a, really an optical illusion. Uh, which, which line is longer? Which of you thinks the bottom one is longer? Which one? Okay, no hands went up whatsoever. The top one is longer. Anybody? My meme all raised her hand. Uh, this is usually used for, uh, to show that the arrows on the side, the environment, our context, can really make us look at something that we think is objectively right and say, you know, that top line does kind of look a little shorter because of those arrows. But here's the thing. I changed the whole optical illusion. The top line's the longer one. It is actually longer. I, I don't care what you have to say. I changed it on my PowerPoint. The top line is longer. I don't care what you say. I will show you, if you want proof, I will pull out my laptop and I will show you after. The top line is longer. Some of you who probably already saw that said, well, actually, the optical illusionists, they're both the same length. That's not the case here. I just wanted to prove to you this morning by the story that I told and by this example, we are terrible at making judgments, even when sometimes we think we already know what the answer is. You, you may have thought, well, they're both the same length because, hey, uh, I've seen this before. I know. No, you don't. And I'll be honest with you. I probably would have said the same thing uh, if I was in your shoes. The top line is longer. I want to go through a few things. We got to become better at this. Uh, we got to become better at judging. We have to become better at it. Some people say, "Judge not, lest you be judged," and they're quoting Jesus there. And I believe what Jesus said. But as Grant read, if you're really listening to it, Jesus isn't saying, "Don't judge at all." Don't make any judgment whatsoever. Parents, you make judges, judgments all the time with your kids. They do something wrong. You've got to make a judgment on how you're going to punish them and how you're going to react to it. If they did something wrong, then you've already made a judgment on what they've done. It's wrong. It's either good or bad. Think about this one. This is kind of scary for the person who says, you don't need to judge. Is God good? Is he a good God? People say, oh, yeah, he is a good God. He's, he's definitely a good God. That's a judgment. You judged God. God is good. Uh, 
about God's Word that it's true. And so all these different we should not be making. We should stray away from those. And I want to go through those. Then the lesson will be yours. The first thing I want to talk to you all about today is uh, we need to gather the evidence. Uh, some of us, we like to judge and jump to conclusions, and I am really in that group uh, of people. Um, you could have asked me about those lines. Those are actually the same link, by the way. So um, you, you could have asked me about the lines. Cole, did you, do, did you tamper with this before? You could have asked me about that, really asked a bunch of questions and may have come to the right answer. But I want to turn with you to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. If there was a movie made uh, in, about the Old Testament, if there was a movie, I, I really want to see this in a movie, uh, what we're about to read. But 1 Kings chapter 3, we read about Solomon, and we know about Solomon. On the face of the earth at that time, people were coming from all over to listen. Really amazing about what he does in this passage. Starting in verse 16, it says this, Then two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, O oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth, and we were alone. There was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were in the house, and this woman's son died in the night because she lay on me. She lay on him. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while your servant slept and laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born. But the other woman said, No, the living child is mine and the dead child is yours. The first said, No, the dead child is yours and the living is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. Now listen to what he does. Listen to what Solomon does in verse 23. The, the king says, the one says, this one is my son that is alive and your son is dead. And the other says, no, but your son is dead and my son is the living one. And the king said, bring me a sword. And give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was alive living child and by no means put him to death but the other said he shall be neither mine nor yours divide him and the king answered and said give the living child to the first woman by no means put him to death she is his mother isn't that amazing I think that's really a really cool story like I can imagine the end of that movie and that's really the climax of the movie and everybody who watches is like wow that's a pretty good judge I mean, it's a really good judge. He didn't need a lawyer. He didn't need any. He just had to listen. And then, wait, he had to listen. Did you notice how ridiculous that probably would have sounded to Solomon? You know, the, the account, obviously, he needed to know what happened. But then after, there was that back and forth, like, no. Arguing. And he says, stop. He brings the sword out and he says, I'm going to cut this child in half. You can have half, you can have half. Go home happy. He went to great lengths to figure out the truth, didn't he? You know, he, he's the wisest guy who was living on the face of the earth at that time. And don't you think, you know, how many of us probably would have listened to the account and listened to it and said, well, how did you know that it happened at midnight? How in the world did you know that she, she killed her child by laying on the child? How did you know? How do you know all these things in the account? There are some questionable things in that account. But then also, you could probably look at the emotions and their mannerisms. Many of us probably would have said, I bet that's probably the mother. That's the mother. You take the child. How many of us would have stopped after the account and said, All right, I've got to make a decision? How many of us would have done that? How many of us would have gone to the lengths of the sword and said, Listen, we've got to make sure that this is the case? We've got to make sure. Or how many of us would have never even just listened to the women? Notice in verse 16, the way the, the story starts, it says, then two prostitutes 
came to the king and stood before him. I'm not talking to those, those women. I'm not talking to them. I got better things to do. I'm a king. I think it's amazing that Solomon sacrificed his time to listen to two harlots, two prostitutes. Because a baby was in the balance. Don't miss what he did. As a wise king, I'm sure he could have made a good decision after the account. I'm sure he probably... He said, I, this still isn't... In the Bible, this is really echoed kind of in the New Testament, this idea of we need to listen. In John chapter 7, verses 45 through 52, turn there with me. You remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus, the man who went to Jesus by night in John chapter 3, and they talked about being born of water and the Spirit. Uh, We remember that conversation. He was a Pharisee. He was of the Pharisees. But he didn't want people to know. That's why he went by night. And so in John chapter 7, Starting in verse 45, the Bible says the officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees. Arrest him, bring him to us. Answered them, Have you also been deceived? Cursed and Nicodemus, listen to what he says. them, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? He's saying, listen, there's just, there's just something wrong here. There's just really something wrong here. I, we're about to make a decision. We're about to judge this man. And y'all haven't even talked to him. Does it? We, we need witnesses. We need to hear. or what he was sent to do. They wanted him dead. Listening to Jesus and thinking, could I... You know, maybe he could be the Son of God. Let's listen more to what he has to say. They jump to conclusions... really jump to conclusions on the third day. The tomb's empty. Baby on a train. It was a passenger train and there was the, the type of train where, you know, the carts, uh, they'll have numerous people within it. And uh, his baby was crying. And he was trying to comfort the baby and uh, the baby just kept crying and getting louder and louder. And the people in the cart were just getting more anxious and, and just more annoyed by, by the loud sounds of the baby crying. And, and a man who was in the cart thought that he was speaking for everybody else in the cart with him. And he speaks up and says, listen, can you please quiet that baby or just take that baby to its mother, please? Everybody in here is annoyed. Please just relieve us and take that child to his mother. And he looks up at the man and says, This child to his mother. But she's on the back of this train in a coffin. And I'm doing the best I can. How many times have we looked at somebody and made a judgment call before we even talked to them? We said, we don't need to spend time with them. I, I don't want y'all spending time with them. Don't do that. And we've never even heard their story. Elders in the church, y'all, y'all have such a great... Learn from this is when there's...
going on, we have to listen to every party before we make a decision on what to do. We cannot jump to conclusions or anything like that. And then, and then maybe even parents here, when, when, when a child... told his son to not touch a toy that was he kept trying to touch it and stuff and, and was going to knock it over well the dad slapped the boy's hand conclusion Immediately, man, we think we're so good at it, but we mess up so much. Let's listen to stories before we make a judgment call. To be acting that way. Maybe we could learn something from somebody and even gain a friend. We need to first gather the evidence. The next thing that I really want to talk to you about is we need to hold ourselves to the same standard. The, the, the standard... ...to make a righteous judgment about... ...judge righteous judgment. There's nothing wrong with making a righteous judgment. But we also need to hold ourselves to that same standard. In Romans chapter 2, we, we see something going on here uh, along the lines of this, this idea. Romans chapter 2, Paul's really addressing Jew and Gentile here, but this applies to everybody. Uh, starting in verse 1 in Romans 2, Paul says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man. You have no excuse, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment... same things. Just keep reading with me. We know that the practice such things and yet do them yourself that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume by the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that you not wrath for yourself on the day of wrath? when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. What's he talking about here? He's saying, listen, there's some people in here who think they're, so, they're, they're righteous, they're so righteous that they're the standard, their life is the standard, and they're going around and saying, you don't need to be doing that, but yet, behind closed doors, they're doing the same exact thing. You're guilty of the same thing. Yes, you're right in accusing that person of, of doing that thing, but have you checked your own life? Who are you? What ground do you have to stand on to say that, that I am morally capable of making this judgment? It's hypocritical. That word hypocrite, at the time that it was being used in the biblical times, it meant an actor. You're just an actor. We all know who you are. You're just acting and trying to put up a show for everybody. And the next one is Matthew. One through five, we'll read it again. Judge not, this is Jesus speaking, Sermon on the Mount. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He said, Listen, the standard that you're using. He says, You're going to judge, and whatever you judge, you need to look in the mirror when you do it. Because if you're guilty of that sin, he says, he goes on and says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Ouch. Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. He said, Listen, you got a bigger problem here. Your point now. And the same things. I 
restaurants on it. And so I'm, I do and I turn down Airport Road, and I meet about five cars who have their brights on. And you can imagine how terrified I was. I just, had, I just got my driver's license, and I can't see. I'm terrified. And I'm thinking, why in the world do you have your brights on? How many people have their brights on tonight? I mean, is it, is it darker than usual tonight? I, I, I don't know. Well, I drop my friend off, and I pull back out on the road. It is dark. It, and as a matter of fact, it's almost pitch black. I can't see. And so what I do is I acknowledge my mistake of not having my lights on. And I turned my lights on. They were trying to tell me that my lights were not on. And I kept looking at them. Listen, everybody else's headlights are brighter from the view of your car. And it's the same way with the sins of others. Everybody else's sin, everybody else's problems seem bigger when we're looking out. But when we consider ours, it, we're sometimes blinded by it. We need to be aware of that. We need to hold ourselves to the same standard. We're under God's standard. So let's do that. And uh, then lastly, we don't need to judge with partiality. And they were being partial to a group and how they looked. In James chapter 2, uh, he, really, he really hammers this down. And he's trying to make a point here. <clears throat> and so we look here and he's talking about the rich and uh, he's trying to make the point of we shouldn't look at a person's appearance there's that judge not by appearance but judge righteous judgment he said don't judge by appearance but judge the way God judges in James chapter 2 just starting in verse 1 my brothers show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? What's going on here? Well, he's saying, you're starting to treat People who look rich, who come in and, and seem rich, you're starting to treat them better than the people who come in and they are poor. You don't need to do that. You're judging by appearance. This is, this is unrighteous judgment. My beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor And rich, he says, listen, it's not the rich that are rich in the kingdom of heaven. It, it, it's not those. He says, it's the poor who's going to be rich in faith. He says, if you were judging by the character of somebody, if you were judging according to someone's character, you would have known who the rich person was. Because that's the way God judges. He's going to judge. start looking at people more like God does rather than looking Romans chapter 2 echo oh last after worship and the preacher preached on judgment righteous judgment and he talked about God and being the righteous judge and, and he, he shows no partiality it doesn't matter who you are it, all that matters is you great sermon well dad goes home partiality
Can you tell me something that you learned today? Just one thing. And the son said, well, Dad, to be honest, I didn't really learn anything. I, I, I'm really just confused on that partiality word that he said. And he said, well, let me tell you a story. And so uh, the kid said, all right. He said, there was a king. He had two sons. Everyone loved the king who was in the kingdom. Uh, he was a righteous king. And he showed no partiality, son. He said, oh, okay, okay. And so he said, shows no partiality. But there came a night, an evil night, where there was a cry throughout all the kingdom. And the guards, the men who served the king, came in and said, Sir, we've, we found something. In this. Just sit down when we say it. And he sat down and he said, your, your firstborn son has been murdered. Someone took his life tonight as he was asleep. And the, the king mourned, but he said, Find the murderer now because this man is deserving of death so they went out the guards went out and they found the murderer he was just about to escape the territory of the kingdom and they found him brought him back on the horses and they brought him in tied up and they threw him down before the king and the king said did you murder my son and the man said I did and I enjoyed it and said okay and he beheaded the man. And the boy who was in the car with the dad said, Dad, that's an awful story. And dad said, it is. He said, but, but I don't understand the partiality thing. How does that come into play? The dad said, the murderer was the king's youngest son. And he still carried out the justice. It didn't matter who the murderer was. The murderer was guilty. It didn't matter what the last name, how much money the person had, how good looking they were. God's going to do what's right. And what's right is rewarding those who have diligently sought his son. Romans chapter 8, I believe it's in verse 32. If y'all will read that with me really quickly. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says something very simple, but when we think about it more, it becomes very powerful. Verse 32 in Romans 8, the Bible says this, He, God the Father, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? A very positive and amazing and comforting passage. God went to great lengths to save us. He even, he even had his son sacrifice for us. But I want y'all to really think about that. Jesus Christ bore the judgment of God. He bore our sins. He was, he became sin for us. He became the propitiation, the, the satisfaction of God's wrath for us. Let me ask you this. If God didn't spare his son, his son, only son Jesus, who didn't commit a sin, how in the world could somebody walk up to God and say, I was the best looking guy around. You got to let me into heaven. God's not going to show partiality. He's not going to show favoritism. He's not going to look at somebody and say, I'm going to judge you differently because of the way that you look over here. That's not going to happen. And so, after all these things that we've said, we don't need to judge with partiality. We don't need to judge hypocritically. And we don't need to judge without all the, with sufficient evidence. We don't need to do that. So partiality, I want to make a quick application. You know, my dad said this this morning. He said, Cole, make sure to tell them about the, uh, the dad of the, the kid who's in band, the boy who's in the band, and 160 members, and they're marching down the, uh, the streets doing a parade. And he, he said, make sure you to tell them that uh, the dad leans over to one of the ladies and said, look over there, my boy is the only one in step. He's the only one out of step. And I don't care if he's your boy or not. We don't need to, I guess we can make that application with parents. And your kids are special. 
are very special. But don't disconnect that from reality. If your kids deserve something, they deserve it. If they don't, they don't. And, and I guess with, with church, and we don't need to sit by somebody who's popular just every time simply because everybody knows them or they're rich or that they're just simply funny. Sit by somebody who you haven't met before and who probably doesn't look the same. Don't judge by appearance. Judge righteous judgment. How is God going to judge us? How will God judge me in the last day? Uh, we'll all face judgment. Um, there's no one here who will not. Uh, we will all face judgment. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to read y'all uh, some things that are beautiful about God and the judgment that he will uh, give to us. He's not going to judge without the knowledge of what you've done. Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says, we're going to give an account. He wants to listen to what we've done. You realize that? He is going to listen. He's not going to get up there and say, all right, I know what you've done. Yep, go. He knows all things, but here's the thing. We're going to give an account, and he's going to listen to our account. And so he's not going to judge without sufficient evidence. He knows. He knows all things, and he's not going to judge us unrighteously. Here's another one. He is not going to judge us hypocritically. He sent his son to live a life, a human life here on this earth. Hebrews 4.15 says he was without sin. There is not a sin. There will never be a sin when God is judging us that someone will be able to point the finger right back and say, but you did the same thing. No one will be able to do that because God doesn't have a problem. And lastly, he's not going to judge partially. We talked about that. And things like that. I hate to tell you this, but he doesn't care. He sent his son to die. And that death matters the most to him. And that we have accepted it through faith. Maybe you haven't done that. Maybe you realize that Today, I know I'm going to be judged. And, and, and I have sinned. And I, I, haven't, kept, I haven't kept the law. I haven't, I haven't kept the law of Christ. And I've, I've transgressed. I've sinned over and over. And I need to do what's right. Because God sent His Son to die for me. He loves me. It's not that He wants to condemn us because He hates us. That's... verse and it would make perfect I want you to come forward and become a member of make things